All right, everybody, welcome to Unscripted from my studios in uh, Old Hilliard. And uh, thank you, Corby, for the intro on audio. As always, uh, we've done some jumping around here a little bit. Welcome to technology. Welcome to two podcasters trying to utilize technology. Uh, let me let my guest introduce herself and we will go from there. Hi, I'm Billy Gels, and I'm honored to be here with you. You know, just an old dog learning new tricks is what I am. I feel like every day jumping through hoops, trying to figure it all out. <laughs> same, same. So uh, we where we left off on our uh, as we were trying to figure out technology was I mentioned the fact that uh, I do. We, there's a lot. I have more notes in front of me than ever on any interview I've ever done. Uh, so we have a lot to cover. But I do want to start off with the fact that your husband may have the highest ERA ever in a home run uh, contest. Um, can we talk about that for a minute? What is his yeah. ERA in the home run contest? Yeah, the uh, the funniest meme of the entire home run derby last year was one of him side by side with Jake DeGrom, who at that point had just gone from a sub one ERA above one. I think it was like one, one, five or one, two, five. So on the meme, it had David on one side, Jake on the other, and it had their stats down the side. And when it got to ERA, Jake's was one point, whatever. And David's was infinity. So (laughs) it was, uh, it was quite a fun experience, but he gave up a lot of home runs. A lot of home runs. So for anybody not not familiar, uh, Billy's husband uh, was, I, I, and t- please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, he pitched BP to Pete Alonso in the home run derby. Is that correct? He did. He, he did, did. And he gave up a lot of nukes. <laughs> A lot, a lot of runs, as, as they call them. <laughs> as Pete continues to say to him, thanks for the meatballs. He was, <laughs> right. Dave was texting with Pete the other day, you know, uh, well, after the season. And um, Pete was like, you know, Jesse, I just keep thinking about those meatballs. <laughs> and he's talking about the pitches that David That's threw. Right. It was it was pretty impressive. David did quite a, an amazing job. He's been throwing BP for a hundred years. I mean, he's about 120 years old at this point. And it feels like in baseball, in baseball years, we've been right. in pro ball. Yeah. We've been in pro ball for 35 years. He was in college ball before that he was throwing batting practice when he was in college to teammates, you know, and then in turn became a college baseball coach and then got into professional baseball and has been throwing BP for many, many years. So we call him the rubber arm because his arm just keeps going, you know, it's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. Well, in some of my pregame homework, I saw where he did an interview with uh, Barstool Sports. So I, <laughs> in six degrees of separation, I am now connected to Barstool Sports because your husband did an interview with them, but he was talking about the very thing you're talking about, his arm and how it wasn't <laughs> sore from throwing <laughs> all those home run pitches. Okay. You want to hear a funny story? How much Absolutely. time do we have? Okay. Here's a funny, here's the funny bar stool story. So we have three boys, right? Our boys are your typical 25 to 31 year old young men that are in this sports bar stool is a go-to for them. Yeah. So on the night, the Derby happened, my husband, we were at the stadium, saw my husband, all that. My husband goes, Oh, go somewhere. Tell me where you are. I'll meet you afterwards because we were going to meet Pete at the he was having this big celebration. So we needed a space between them for us to go. So we found this restaurant bar area just down this back, felt like a back alley. We were trying to find somewhere that didn't have 4 million people in it. We found (laughs) it. We're in there, you know, all the kids, we had some friends with us, girlfriends with us. We, you know, it was just really, really fun. We were so excited for dad. And my youngest son looks at me and he goes, Oh my gosh. Uh, Okay, I'm going to get this wrong. Is their podcast is Pardon? They have so many. They have there's one Pardon Pardon My Take. Pardon My Take. That's the one. Correct. Pardon My yes. Take. Yes. And he goes, Pardon My Take, just PMT just tweeted about dad. <laughs> and I went, Oh my gosh, what's PMT? And of course, the boys were like, Mom, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and it's the most listened to podcast in the world. It's amazing. So I'm like, that's cool. Well, we started talking to people and all of a sudden I hear my son go, oh no. And I go, what? He goes, they just tweeted at me. I'm like, why'd they tweet at you? He goes, because I tweeted at them about, yeah, my dad was awesome. Oh, and they wow. tweeted back your dad question mark. And Will it was like, what do I do? I'm like, I don't know. Tweet back at him. So tweet about, yeah, my dad's Dave Giles, blah, blah, blah. And 
So we start talking again. And all of a sudden I feel his hand on my shoulder and this body like collapse into me. He goes, mom, I just made the biggest mistake in my life. I oh, go, no. what? Right. He goes, they DM'd me and asked for dad to be on the show. And I said, oh, yes, without asking fantastic. dad. Fantastic. Well, what you've got to understand too, is David and I are very strong Christians. Yes. You know, part yes. of my take is not the most politically nope. correct podcast nope. in the world. Correct. So Will's freaking out that he has misrepresented his father. Oh no. And he's, he's like panicking. And I was like, well, no big deal. Ask dad. He'll get it approved by the Mets. Dad's a pretty strong man. He's not going to crumble and embarrass himself on a podcast just because it's, you know, a testy (laughs) podcast. Right. And so long story short, David got the interview with the podcasters. And at that point, we're calling Will his PR guy because Will's gotten him this amazing (laughs) interview. And Will's still freaking out. Dad, if they start embarrassing you, just shut it down, shut it down. They were so respectful. They were so wonderful. But what Will thought was going to be a two minute interview turned into a 45 minute interview. Yeah, it's long. Right, right. It's fantastic. And I I already love the first five, seven minutes of this interview. (laughs) Now now you all know why this is. I've been looking forward to this. Um, It's not why we got on here. We didn't get on here to talk about the home run contest. We didn't get on here to talk about Barstool Sports or Sorry, I'm wasting your your podcast minutes here. And I'm so sorry. I asked the question, so it's so uh, wonderful, but um, uh, that's fun. That's fun. You're a baseball family, and I think that's yeah. what uh, um, I think it will set us on, hopefully, <laughs> to unscripted. We're going somewhere with this, but um, the uh, uh, I think it sets us up well. Um, you have also a very important story and a very important career and, and a very important um, thing that we want to talk about. So, uh, but, but at the same time, your husband did throw BP to Pete Alonzo who gave up a million home runs. And now you've been on part on part of my take, whatever it's called, you've been on Barstool. I know, it's crazy. Uh, you're, but you're a baseball family, which is very yeah. cool. So let's cover that really, really quick, because I do want to get into a lot of the other yeah. things that we got on to talk about. Um, but you're a baseball family, three baseball players, uh, your well, husband's a career baseball guy, right? And so I'll let you tell the story, but but just yeah. to introduce it, you all are a baseball family. Yeah, uh, David has been a professional coach now. We're going into our 35th season um, and we raised three boys in it and we always felt like home was where the family was together. So we drug them around to all these different places. We've lived in 15 different cities and towns in the US, Dominican Republic and Venezuela. Um, in all of that, our lives have been consumed by baseball in many, many ways. One yeah. being that I'm a fan. I love baseball. I mm-hmm. used to go sit at the little ballpark in my hometown in Eastern North Carolina and watch my friends play Babe Ruth, you know? And so this isn't new to me. This wasn't something that was new to me, but I also knew how hard the baseball life was. So I yes. prayed, I prayed really hard as the boys were growing up. Do not let them find a forever career in baseball it's too hard for Mm. the wives now none of them are married yet however god laughed at me as he often does he finds me very humorous when i say no to him Um, our oldest is an area scout with the san francisco giants he oversees the carolinas so he's scouting high school and college players within the carolinas any amateur player in the carolinas our middle son um is a mental conditioning coach with the Arizona Diamondbacks. He Mm. reads, writes, and speaks Spanish fluently. So he oversees a lot of their Latin American population in their minor league system with mental conditioning coaching, which is sports psychology. He went and got a master's in sports psychology on the field as a mental conditioning coach. And then our baby boy, who's now 25, (laughs) so much a baby anymore, is a director of pitching technology at Boston College with their baseball team. Wow. Wow. So mm-hmm. I, I feel like we need to have you on multiple times to cover yeah. each one of those things. Uh, I don't want to take, and I, I, in all respect to all of that, you, those are all very important uh, in yeah. all respect to all of those. I don't want to take a lot of time, but I would love to take a lot of time someday to unpack yeah. each one of those, especially the psychology side, the mental side. Yeah. Um, I'll put Charlie on with you. You can give Charlie a call and have him on the podcast. He's really good. They're I would all love three it. really good at what yeah. they do, but you know, Charlie's really got this extreme heart for mental conditioning and really allowing these young men to connect with where they are, who they've been created to be in this baseball world and do that in a positive way. So, yeah. Wow. 
Yeah. It's, and then I could talk about pitching because my son's a pitcher. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> goodness, seriously, we have so much to cover. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, so this is the cliff notes as we get into what we really got onto today. But at the end of the day, I just wanted everybody to know who I'm talking to. This is really amazing. Yeah. Uh, an amazing family. Um, one of the other things that uh, you said in our pregame that you creeped on me a little bit, I creeped on you as well. Um, <laughs> you all are involved in compassion. Can you talk a little um, bit about compassion? That's a passion beyond passion for me. Um, David and I have always felt like we wanted to serve in our backyard when we lived in or out of the country. And one of the ways that we got connected was through Compassion International with sponsorship. And we sponsor a child, Rosa, in Santo Domingo. And so I went down with Compassion on a trip, a vision trip, as they call them, where you go down into the country. And I went with a bunch of baseball people. And it was just a group of baseball people. And we went down and to see the amazing work that Compassion does in their programs, I went from offering, you know, compassion, compassion sponsorship. When I go out to speak, I'll encourage people to sponsor children because I believe in what compassion does to seeing the actual programs in, in action, to see that they partner with churches in neighborhoods, in villages, in, in barrios, in, in areas that a lot of people don't get into and understand. And what they do is they partner with those churches because those churches live, eat, sleep, everything with that community. Wow. So there are very many compassion programs mm -hmm. that you don't see the name of compassion. They want to promote that church. And in that, these people are getting, you know, the word of the Lord into them. They're getting Jesus spoken into their lives. They're getting the action of Christ acted on in their lives. And so in seeing that I came home and Poor David, my husband, he is an amazing man. He's an amazing man of God, but he has said many times in the past that the day he met me, he knew he had to continually keep a parachute near him because he never knew when I was going to walk in and say, let's jump into this. Let's go, right. And right. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I came home and I was like, hey, I learned about their survival programs. My heart is really broken for these in their survival pr programs. They work with moms, pregnant moms through the first year of life. Because in many areas throughout the world, the death rate for children before they turn one is 80 or 90%. Mm. That's unheard of. But when you have unassisted birth, no prenatal care, you know, all of these things, you can see how that, that increases. So they go into these communities and they bring in pregnant women and work with them through that first year of life. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so David and I, um, with compassion, chose a survival program that's three blocks from one of the stadiums that David managed at in wow. a very poor area. And it's actually San Pedro de Macari, which is the number one place for short stops. Well, Seems like all the short stops come out of San Pedro. Wow. But this is where we could go in and partner with compassion to you know, pour into the lives of these women and children. And we're mm. just honored that we can partner with compassion and be able to make the difference in the lives of what we call family or our home. You know, it's one of our home countries right. and to be able to pour into that. And also for players that we've been with for so many years that are Dominican, that we're helping build up their community. We're pouring Jesus's love into their home. And yeah. we just, we love that. Mm. And again, that wasn't even another reason why we got on today. <laughs> but, but I just want people to know, like, seriously, that yeah. now you know why I have 15 post-it notes in front of me. Um, <laughs> I think the other thing too, my wife and I, and I'll just be very transparent for a minute. Um, one of the hardest days for me, we went through a season financially, I don't know, uh, nine, 10 years ago, and uh, we had to make some significant cuts and at the time where we were. And the one of the, and I actually have a blog post out there, not a plug, um, of, of the day that we had to decide that the thing we had to, like we got, we had to go that thin in our, in our budgeting. Yeah. Um, and compassion was one and we yeah. had sponsored someone, but we, we were literally at that point as a family. And that was honestly, I don't know that anything, you know, my cable didn't hurt my, my cell phone, whatever, you know, we made a lot of cuts and those didn't hurt. That one hurt because it's not yeah. expensive. It's so inexpensive. And we don't even know what those dollars are doing until this side of heaven, I should say. Yeah. We, we, uh, I, I dream of the day that we walk into heaven and know, yeah. uh, and we see uh, the impact of, and that's not yeah. why we do it. Um, 
we do it because it's just a, that I think we're called to do it. And, um, and now I'm glad we're sponsoring again, you know, we're back Good. to a place, but, That's but awesome. um, that was one of the hardest days for us in the full transparency was the yeah. day we had to, we had to make that decision. That was very, very tough. Yeah. Compassion got really hit hard when the pandemic hit because they yeah. had to shut down all their compassion Sundays and mm-hmm. their concerts, you know, yeah. they right. get sponsored children. Right. So in that they knew within a year, they would lose the support for 70,000 children that they had wow. already committed to. Wow. And Jimmy Mulatto, the president, CEO of compassion, his heart guys, I've never, I've never met a, a man or a woman in leadership in a leadership position like Jimmy Mulatto that has the tremendous heart for the children. Mm-hmm. It's not the organization. It's not that it is the actual one child at a time attitude yeah. Yeah. and it broke his heart. And so yeah. we came together as a, uh, as a professional athlete community and some larger churches and larger businesses and raised money to be able to cover those 70,000 children. And within a year and a half, we ended up being able to help raise money for about 74,000 children. And they raised over $33 million. Wow. And awesome. that's not saying like, oh, look at the money we right. raised. Right. No, look at the children we helped. The lives impacted. Lives impacted. And seriously, like a life impacted right. each individual. But it wasn't just the one child this time. It was the entire family because they couldn't do programs. They started pouring the money that they were giving to programs into food to bring to the houses. And there was this one sweet story of this Dominican child who was out playing in this area. And she saw the compassion worker coming in on the last day of in the program. They had said to the children, we promise you, we will not forget you. And this little girl looked up and she saw this compassion worker. And I've heard the interview with the compassion worker and the compassion worker walked up, saw the child and was like, Hey, and the kid looked up and she started running to her little hut screaming, mommy, mommy, they came, they came. I told you they wouldn't forget about us. Mm. Wow, That's what compassion does. That's right. And so, yeah. Yeah, we could talk, I could talk about Sorry. compassion all day. That is like a Again, huge passion of mine. <laughs> another, another episode for another day, there but, <laughs> um, and if you're all just joining in, um, we just had batting practice. We haven't even started the first inning yet. <laughs> this is, that was a stretch. Yeah. That that was was a stretch. Stretch. <laughs> Honestly, we, we have, uh, there's so much to cover. Um, but I do want to cover, uh, we speaking of books, um, you have a new book and, it, and actually, so you have a podcast, you have a book. So let's talk about which one do you want to talk about first? Either one. I'm ready right, to go. About, let's go with podcasts and then let's really bring it all home with the book. So okay. uh, you have a podcast and it has like I, 250 episodes, which is it's unbelievable crazy. for a guy that has pumped out a ton of episodes. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I was just talking to my husband about it. I'm like, how did I get here? Like how, because I start and the funny thing of it is the podcast name is start small believe big. And it's starting with the small and believing in the big God that can carry you through exactly to the place that he desires you to be. That's Mm -hmm. really what it's about. Mm -hmm. And in the podcast, I really just want to encourage people. Don't stop doing something because it doesn't seem big enough. Don't stop doing something because you're afraid that it has no impact on the kingdom or it doesn't matter. You know, I, we talked about with compassion, one child, what is one life you can speak into? What is that might be yours today. It might be a day that all you can do is is survive your day, but what is the small thing you can do in allowing ourselves to allow God to be glorified in Mm -hmm. what we are, say, and do. So the podcast really started out, it's like a short, short devotional. I do a scripture, I do a little teaching, you know, I start with a story. I do a story, I do a, a, um, a scripture and then a teaching and it ends with a challenge. I am a challenger. I'm a doer. I I like my checklist. So I like to challenge people. Hey, what can you do in response to this? Because we can be potato chip Christians and sit on the couch all day long and eat our Mm. potato chips waiting for God to move in our lives. Mm -hmm. But we got to put some motion into it. We got to put some action into it. And that's what I want to challenge people to do. So that's a podcast. It's been going really well. Once a month, I interview an author. The rest of it's solo. It's just me. Um, me and Jesus, I say nothing else than that. But um, but it's it's wonderful. It's been a great avenue to be able to just, number one, starting it was obedient to God. It was in response to my first book coming out. 
that book was making room, doing less so God can do more. Um, in that book, I taught that was more about the external distractions, like what's going on in your life that's keeping you away from reading the word, hearing God moving forward. And in that book, in the second chapter, I talked about external distractions. Well, in one little section, I talked about the internal distractions that we allow um, to stifle what God desires to do in and through us. And that seemed to be something that resonated with people more than a lot of that book. Mm. I, that was what I got to speak on more, that and intentional living. How do we live with, intent, with the intention to glorify God? And so in those internal distractions, as we all know, when we are brought an idea sometimes and we start thinking about it, we realize the internal, this is what happened to me. I realized the internal distractions that were stifling me from right. doing what God was asking me to do. Right. And as I started researching it and thinking about it, I was really shocked at how I talked to myself. Yeah. I would never talk to a friend that way. I would never talk to my boys that way or my husband or anyone. And I'm speaking words in my own life that are just mean. Yeah. You're not good enough. Yeah. You're not smart enough. You know, the comparison stuff, the degradation of educational level, or, you know, you just, your life doesn't matter. What, what, who wants to listen to you? Yeah. You know, all of these things. And boy, did it it really caused me to go into a deep place of how do I get rid of this? Like, how can I allow God to transform my mind, which we know is in the Bible that the Lord will transform your mind, will help you transform your mind. How can I do that? And so I went into this processing, like I said, I'm a doer, I'm a list maker, started journaling. I started writing down all the, those self-limiting thoughts I was having and how can I overcome those? And so out of that processing came this book because the more I would talk to my girls in baseball or friends or put it out there on social media, people were like, yeah, me too. Tell me how to stop that. How do I stop telling myself that I shouldn't do this, that, or the other? If, if it's as small as walk into a new Bible study, how many women fearfully don't go to Bible study because they don't think they size up? How many don't go to a play group because they think those moms are better moms than them? How, you know, how many times do we stop where we are and not progress in doing something God's asking us to do because of our thought process? So that was the beginning of this book. And the book is called Distraction Detox. So we're actually in this book going through a process of detoxing from those internal emotional toxins that keep us from realizing God's best in our lives. Well, you hit home. So I, I was laughing as you were talking. You probably saw that on the video um, because anyone that's listened for any period of time, especially when you said educational levels, um, I quite often point out the fact that I got 13 on my ACT when I was in high school. Um, Good for I, you. I didn't. <laughs> I'm I, hey, wait a minute. I'm an author and I almost flunked out of high school English. There you go. See? No, it, no, it wasn't. And I'm going to, I'm going to preface this with, it wasn't because I wasn't smart enough, but the right. teacher really made me mad there you go. and forget her. I am not going to read that That's book right. because she told me I didn't know how to interpret it, you know, That's teenage right. stuff. So go you, ahead. You got a little two one six in there. Are you sure you weren't from Cleveland? No, I'm from Eastern North Carolina. So That's right. yeah, That's right. we talked Carolina before we got on. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I am the most, uh, I have been told quite often and sometimes through gritted teeth that I am the most self-deprecating person, uh, that people know. And I can't, so I, I identify very much so with what you're saying, because I, you know, but at the end of the day, that's just the way I am. And I think those voices come in and uh, it's funny that we, we're both running a podcast and yet here we are uh, being very self-deprecating, but I, you know, I just, I don't know anything else. And that's, um, you know, I tell some people that's my shtick. That's, that's my thing. That's like, what, that's who I am, whatever. But I think it, it sometimes irritates people because they, they do really get frustrated with me yeah. because I typically put myself down so often but at the end of the day like I, I that's just the inner voice that's the the me that i know and so i love i love this topic when i saw it and the opportunity to speak to you about it yeah well thank you yeah i think the processing that we go through i 
it's not a one and done book. I'm, you're not going to read the book and be like, oh, check. I don't have these thoughts anymore. But what I want you to do within this book and each each chapter that it, there are 15 chapters in it. It's not extremely long. They're not long chapters. But in each chapter, each of the 15 chapters, at the end of the, end of the chapter, there's a detox challenge. Like I said, I'm a challenger, I'm a doer. So at the end of the chapter, you know, I just want you to sit in that moment of what that chapter was about. So there may be, actually, I'm speaking in Alaska the end of March, which is so exciting. I've never been to Alaska, but the woman got in touch with me and she's like, Billy, I'm reading the book and I, I'm a quick reader, but I can't quick read the book because the Lord's challenging me in this detox challenge. I've got to sit on it a minute. So in those sitting on it a minute of really digging into it, part of it is taking those thoughts captive. Like, what am I saying to myself? Writing them down. And then one at a time thinking about them. How does it make me feel? If I'm telling myself I'm not smart enough to do a podcast, how does that make me feel? It makes me feel small. I don't like it. I feel like a failure because I'm not smart enough, right? In turn, the next chapters as it builds, you learn how to replace that with scripture. Where can you find in scripture of who God's created you to be? And when he calls you, what are you? You're qualified because if God calls you to do something, you're qualified to do it. With my first book, when I met with the acquisition editor talking about self-deprecating, I said to him, he goes, Billy, what's your goal in this book? And, and I'm like, well, if one person reads it and they get something out of it, you know, that, that's great. I said, but I'm from Eastern North Carolina. I don't even speak English, no less write it. So I don't know why you'd pick up my book. Not good when you're trying to pitch the sale of a book, right? right <laughs> he right, ended up right. taking the book because, you know, wow. that was the first book that came because he was like, stop, you know, this is a great idea. Stop telling yourself it's not. You're going to be fine. Your writing is good. Keep learning, keep building. And so those are the ways I challenge myself. So in the, in the book, it takes you through capturing the thoughts and not just capturing them and, and writing them on a paper and burning them or throwing them away, but sitting with them, holding them for a minute and being like, where is this stopping me from doing the best that God's asking me to do to glorify him? And then in turn, replacing it with scripture and that, you know, I've, I have scripture all over my walls because I never want to be too far from scripture that if I have a thought and I will, another self-deprecating thing, I am terrible at memorizing scripture. Right. I can talk about scripture all day long, but to be that good little church lady that reads it front to back in three different versions, That's word right. for word, That's it right. ain't me. Like yeah. it is not me, but I can pull it out of my hat of different scripture of what it, the gist of it. But in my office, I have a lot of scripture on the wall because I don't want to be too far from it. I want to make sure that that's the first thing I think of after that needling thought comes in of, oh, God, I'm going to do terrible on this podcast with Aaron. <laughs> well, no, because, right. you know, I sought the Lord. He answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. A fear is I'm going to look like an idiot. Well, yeah. as my boys have told me for 31 years now, mom, you look like an idiot when you do that, you know, whatever <laughs> it is. But, but it, you know, it is taking those thoughts captive, feeling them, understanding where they're stopping us, replacing it with scripture, and then taking the steps into the place that you can make a difference and make an impact on the kingdom for the Lord. Wow. I think we live in a time where, um, you know, one mental health has become your son is, yeah. is in that role. Um, yes. Mental health has finally been pushed to the front. And I think that's because of the pandemic and whatever other reasons, but I'm just glad it's there. Um, I think yeah. I've mentioned it in other podcasts. I myself am in counseling and therapy and yeah. I found it wonderful because I think your point is exactly right. Um, I can capture those thoughts, but yeah. what's the root? Why? You know, cause yeah. I think some of it could be somebody said something to me at work. Uh, exactly. some of it could be, and I, and I don't know, I, it's your, I can't wait to read the book no, because, go for because it. I think some of it could be, uh, something a long, long time ago. Maybe it was yeah. when I was a kid, maybe it was something my parents said to me, maybe it was something a coach yeah. said to me as a baseball person. Uh, Absolutely. maybe it was something someone said to me left a scar and that scar has now become something I'm owning. And I think it sounds like this book would help. Let's release the scar. Let's not forget the scar because it's there yeah. for a reason, but let's move on and live in a, in a place of truth versus yeah. right. Is that right? Am I? Yeah. What are right? you, 
Yeah. I mean, what are you hearing? Like, it may be that that teacher told me in high school that I didn't know how to um, interpret a book. I can't even think of the word she used, but she had asked me, we read a book. Only book I read in high school was freshman year. Be honest Mm -hmm. with you. Never read a book because I went into class and I said, this is what I think it is. Oh, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea. Well, in turn, that made me think that I didn't know what I was talking about. I shouldn't read books. I shouldn't try to interpret what they say, which Mm. also led to, can I really understand the Bible? Am I that dumb that I can't understand the Bible? So I allowed that, I don't know, 30 second voice in my life to take root. And I did not read another book until we were living in Venezuela and there weren't much else to do when the boys were napping mm-hmm. and the downstairs little gift shop in the, in the strip mall had a, a, a corner of, a, of English books, you know, and I, the lady encouraged me to take one and I took the smallest one there was, <laughs> it was tiny, mm-hmm. but in turn, I started allowing myself the freedom to read and interpret it for me. You know, what do I think of it? I don't need to give an answer to that teacher freshman year of high school, even though I probably want to go back and go, look, I wrote two That's books, right. you know, That's right. That's um, right. but it allows us to overcome it. The scripture that I've been really sitting on lately is Galatians 5.1 for it, it, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The yoke of slavery for me was the words that woman said to me mm. that in turn, I, I overcame in Venezuela because God put us in a place that this was back way back when talking about telling your age way back when we had one TV station, mm. you know, we had radio was all Spanish, which I speak some Spanish, but every now and then you like the meatloaf of your own language, your own That's culture, right. you know, right. and right. But I was in that place where the Lord took me to really set me free of allowing that woman's voice to be speaking over me. And there's so many other things. The majority of what I say to myself in my own head, though, is stuff I've come up with. Mm. It's my own self-prescribed, self-limiting beliefs of what I can and can't do. Wow. And that is what has gotten me stuck. Yeah. And so, yeah. Wow. So. I don't know if it's in the book uh, and I apologize. I haven't had a chance to read it. No, uh, I look good. forward to reading it, but um, I assume that that also helps those of us that are self-deprecating that yeah. to um, maybe not be that way to others. Um, understand, as you said, that teacher, does that make us more, do you think, and I'm just, we're unscripted. Um, yeah. Welcome to unscripted. Do you think that because we uh, and some of us that are, I'm an empath, um, I'm a number two on the whatever gram yeah. thing it's called. Um, because we are that way, do you think we are, our, our antennas are way up into the words that we say to other people or no? Yeah, I think so. But I think the thing we've got to do is to move forward from that. Right. We can define ourselves in so many different ways, you know, on the Enneagram or the mm-hmm. whatever other personality tests, whatever those are. Yeah, those are a good indicator, but what is it that you can do to live in that healthy version of it? And that's remembering who God created you to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing over my lifetime. And also in getting into this, really researching Mm -hmm. my thoughts and overcoming those was, am I really acting on who God created me to be? Or am I acting on the patterns of what my thoughts tell me I am? And that's where I had to go back to scripture and re-evaluate what is my mind telling me and what is my heart telling me? And if I'm really leaning on my mind, I have a list of all the self-limiting, self-deprecating things there. And I'm more sensitive when people say things to me. I told you I was very transparent in the beginning that there was a platform yesterday I was doing a podcast interview on. It went south and it went south fast. It's and the kid helped me out. And he helped me out a ton. Yeah. But and in that, my husband's overhearing him, this kid, and this kid, he's in his late 20s. But you know, he's trying to guide me and lead me. And I was so like determined that it wasn't gonna work because in mm-hmm. my head, I'm not smart enough to deal with this. Mm-hmm. I am not te- technologically savvy. I'm old. I, you know, whatever it was, like 
because of the voices that I was saying to myself in my head, I couldn't hear John tell me, Hey, Billy, we're going to do the best we can and get through it. And we'll re-record. Don't worry. It's going to yeah. work out. Yeah. You know, today when we had a problem, you went immediately to let's go to a different platform. We're going to get it done. And in that, because <laughs> I'm trying to live out my book is that I did take that thought captive of, you know what, we're going to just take it in a different path. This is not doomsday. It's not the end of the world. I'm not a terrible human being. I'm not stupid. I'm not, you know, they're not going to think I'm a bad person because I can't figure it out. Whatever it may be, you take that thought captive and go, okay, Lord, you're here to guide and lead us in the direction you want us to go. If this is meant to be, it's going to be meant to be, where do yeah. you want us to be? And so it's really taking those thoughts before you get too deep into, now we have to evaluate them, right. where they came from. When I evaluated my thoughts about so many things, I looked back to that one thing that teacher said, or one thing someone else said that reconfirmed it in my head. It wasn't their words as much as it was my ownership. Mm. And if I take that ownership captive mm -hmm. before it roots in mm -hmm. my entire being and stops me mm -hmm. from living out the purpose that God's called me to live out, then I can replace it with the truth, whatever that may be. And in the book, I go through so many different scriptures of, for, you know, what is the deception? What is the truth? And how do we replace it? We bring the deception up. We know that we may feel unloved. Well, what do we know? God loves right. us, right? Right. right? He loved us so much that he gave his life for us. You know, I go into when the lady with, um, uh, with the bleeding issue goes to Jesus and touches his robe and he looks at her and says, daughter, you are healed for your faith. You believed. Yeah. You know, Yeah. there's so many scripture in, in the Bible that tells us that God loves us. Why do I think I'm unloved? Why am I sitting in the stands of a ballpark that has 35,000 people at it feeling lonely? Mm, mm -hmm. Right. I have 35,000 people around me. Right. I have wives in the stands who I know love and, and adore me because I love and adore them. We live life with each other. This is our family for six, eight months a year yeah. that ends up extending itself once we meet each other and live life together. But, you know, we're sitting there together and there's so many girls sitting there feeling lonely. Wow. Yeah. Their yeah. husbands are at the peak of their career and they feel lonely and right. isolated. And why is that? Because we have these thoughts that are telling us that we can't belong to that group because they're good friends and I'm new. I can't step into where they are. They make more money than me or they, you know, they're from a different country or whatever it may be that stops you. Why do you feel unloved in the beginning? Maybe you have a hurtful past. Maybe you have a hurtful relationship, be it a parent or a, an old boyfriend or someone that told you, you couldn't be loved. Yeah. And why are you allowing them to control you through it when you see? So that's where we walk through, you know, determining the distractions, evaluating the distractions, and then terminating the toxins, because there's <sighs> yeah. a termination there that we go from deception to truth. And we stand in the truth of Christ and we can walk in that be for it is freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm. Yeah. Stand firm. Don't go back and hold on to that yoke of slavery. What's your yoke of slavery? Get rid of that yoke of slavery and allow Christ to take the yoke for you yeah. and to pull you through it. And so that's where I think it's so important that once we've rooted that up, we let it go. We've got to let it go and live and stand firm in the truth that Christ tells us that we are his child. We are deeply loved. We are forgiven. We have no shame. There mm. is no condemnation. There's just so much truth that I myself read through so many times and go, yeah, that's really good for Aaron. That's really good <laughs> that's for David. Right, that's right. really good for my boys. But when do I sit down and take it into myself? And that's that pausing moment of pause. Feel the feel of the hurt, know where it came from, but let it go and allow the word to wash over you and fill your spirit with God's word so that you can remember it. Maybe not memorize it like I can't, but you remember it when that thought comes up again. I'm not good enough. Oh, but God says I am because yeah. I know this scripture. Oh, I don't feel like I'm loved. Well, God says you are because mm. he died for you. And, yeah. you know, and so I feel like my shame from the past. I did this one wrong thing to my kid when he was nine years old. I yelled at him, you know, and 
right now, my kids and I have great relationships. I joke around that our kids like us too much. They call us every day. They <laughs> stop by and stay for like three weeks on end, you know, whatever it may be. So I'm holding on to this hurt that I caused him. And at the time I asked for forgiveness. I was screaming at him about some worldly thing that he had been exposed to. And I was screaming at him out of fear. And afterwards I was crying and I got on my knees and I just held his hands and I said, please forgive me. Mm. And he goes, mom, I do forgive you. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done this. I, you know, I, I said, I know, but my words were hurtful. Please forgive me. Let them go and let God's love pour on you when mine didn't. Wow. And we moved on, you know, we had up and down times during teenage years. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't a perfect relationship forever, but they, they're with us now. So why do I go back and feel the shame of that? When people ask me advice on being a mom, the first thing I think of is I yelled my kid into a corner. How can I tell you about how to be a mom? I'm a terrible mom, right? Right. Right. Where if I think about it and I go, you know what? That's the root of that shame. That shame holds me no longer for, you know, Jesus sacrificed his life to forgive my sins. That was a sin. He forgave it. I asked for forgiveness. We moved on. DJ loves me now. Charlie loves me now. Will loves me now. We have a great adult relationship with our children And in that, I can speak in to younger moms and talk to them about how to stay strong in that. So that's where you take that thought captive that happened. My oldest kid's 31. That was when he was like 10, 11 years old. It's 20 years ago, people get over it. Like, (laughs) and I'm not saying that I'll ever totally forget about it, but I've moved past it. Does that shame come up? Yeah, the shame comes up. But what do I do? I take it captive. I replace it with the truth the truth in God's word, the truth that my kids still love me and I move forward wow. and I'm not going to allow that to stop me in, in my seat of pouring into the life of a mom next to me that has three little kids, a husband that travels 90% of the year and she feels alone and sad. And she yelled at her kid that day. And she feels like she hates herself. Now, if yeah. I don't speak into her life, who is mm. mm-hmm. so <sighs> That's where that trying to realize God's best in our life, a clear mind shows you a clearer purpose. Mm -hmm. When you clear your mind of those things that are holding you back from taking that small step towards Jesus and where he wants you to be, that's when your purpose begins. It may not be all laid out and, you know, in big light, step one, step two, step three, but you know, step one, and that's in one direction. Mm-hmm. And you take that step in that direction and the Lord will show you where you need to go after that. Wow. My mom um, was a huge influence in my life and passed uh, about 10 years ago. Um, mm. And I always think back to the things that she said at the time I rolled my eyes. And uh, <laughs> because I was self-deprecating, even in high school, uh, you know, and, and an empath and everything else, as you just said, um, you know, things would happen and I would, I would be upset or whatever. And she would say, take what you think applies and throw the rest away. Oh, I love that. (laughs) That was it. Like, and now I look back at it and I'm like, okay, that's pretty smart. You know, but some, I'm like, amazing how how smart your mom gets when you get older, huh? That's right. That's right. But it's, you know, it's what you just said. It would take what you think applies, you know, hold on to that because, you know, we, we should be uh, able to take constructive criticism, but not to the place where we allow it to change us. But you know, I, I mean, I started a business because of something somebody said to me. Um, I work very hard every day because of something else that that same person said to me. And, I, and yeah. those two truths are honestly driving me every single day. Yeah. Um, so I think we can we can do things with the things that we're told. But I love what you said. Take it captive. Replace yeah. it with the truth. And then move forward. Uh, that's just mm-hmm. so it's wonderful. I can't wait to wait to read the book. So you have been amazing. We have covered a lot of different <laughs> post-it notes in front of me. Um, all that to say, uh, for everyone, what are all the links? So let's start with number one, the podcast, where can we find the podcast? What's it called? You know what? I'm good. It's called start small, believe big. Easiest okay. way to find anything about me is on my website, billyjouse.com, B-I-L-L-I-E-J-A-U-S-S. Uh, and you can find it all on my website, start small, believe big podcast. I also have a daily devotion I send out Monday through Friday, 
It's called Morning Sunshine, S-O-N. I'm so funny, aren't I? Um, <laughs> and uh, funny. Send that. <laughs> my kids don't think so. Can you call them? I think I might have given you a kid's number earlier. Who knows? But um, no. But yeah, so I send out a daily devotion. The, the Start Small, Believe Big. You can find the um, books on there, where to buy those and where the books are sold, Making Room and Distraction Detox. And then you can also find out information on Compassion International because if, you know, if people want to know more, shoot me an email. I'll talk about compassion all day long. I yeah. love them. I love what they do. I have been on the ground with them in Dominican Republic multiple times now. I trust them as an organization. I've told friends about them that now trust them tremendously. You know, it is a wonderful organization. So drop me a line if anybody has any more questions with any of the things. Billy at BillyJouse.com. B-I-L-L-I-E. I-E. <laughs> J-A. U S S S S. Yep. U S S. Okay. This J A U S S. Yep. This has been wonderful. Um, I, you. you know, I, I'm just so blessed. I, I'm blessed that I get to do this. Uh, this has been one of the more fun, honestly, the most fun <laughs> ones I've had, uh, both pre and during, uh, it was a lot of fun and we had to rearrange, you know, the deck chairs a little bit to get to, uh, to this platform, to get it done today. But I'm so yeah. thankful that you were patient with that. No, and my um, pleasure. Uh, it's been wonderful. It's been so wonderful. Yeah. I wish you nothing but the best. Um, I'm sure you, we will be too. in touch again. And I'd love to uh, yeah. to unpack a lot of the things that we talked about. But uh, website, one more time. Billyjouse.com. B-I-L-L-I-E-J-A-U-S-S.com. Correct? That's it. It there is. Even a guy like me sees that was self-deprecating. <laughs> I just did it. Do dude. not self-deprecate that right there. You turn it around and you say, you know what? The Lord has made me really smart. Just to say, Aaron, sometimes it takes a little longer for some of us yeah. to allow God to work in us. You know, okay. we right. get smart at an older age and you're not as old as I am. So <laughs> you got some years. Well, I appreciate you. This My has been pleasure. a ton of fun. Thank you so much. Best of Thank luck in the you. book. And I'm sure we will be in touch again soon. Definitely. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.